Hello, every folks, and welcome to a, however long this ends up being, of uh, just random knowledge about Tactics Ogre Reborn. Um, basically speaking, there's been a, a uh, kind of a request for an advanced build guide for a decently long time now, and I wanted to wait until we had more information. So, uh, there's still some stuff that we're waiting to find out. Like, for example, I still don't know specifically uh, whether or not, uh, like, let's say, using something like Dodge actually improves your parry rate, uh, because when I was doing solo runs, it sure as hell felt like it. But then again, like with many things about this game, it's kind of like trying to describe your pathological liar friend to everybody else in your friend group. Um, just kind of a case of like, uh, so guys, I can kind of vaguely describe how uh, they operate, but I may not be able to tell you exactly what they're up to today. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what we're looking at here. So let's, uh, let's kind of get into it here. Just kind of cover some random mechanics, thoughts, processes, all of that kind of thing to hopefully improve your experience with TOR here. First and foremost, have you ever been in a situation where you got tired of your spellcasters getting shot by archers? Have you ever considered making them hover? <laughs> so this was a dumb thing that I was testing with the other day, but if you were to, for example, go into Farampa, get an undead octopus, and just give them a ring of clouds, uh, it's one of those things that you can get very easily in the early parts of Palace of the Dead. It may seem useless at first, however, it does change its properties. Um, namely, um, every item, despite uh, whatever minimal thing it may have, is never as simple as, hey, it does this one thing. It usually has a whole slew of other weird side effects that it never bothers telling you about. So sure, it has hover as a buff, but what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that they can jump one tile higher, but they themselves sit one tile higher and nothing happens to that one underneath them. Essentially, this means that uh, you, you can do two interesting things with it. For one, beast units can still be climbed up on uh, to be used as staircases if you didn't know this. So for example, you could park this guy underneath the house and just have somebody jump on top of him to go hang out on a roof. Um, but at the same time, if you use something like Cloudwalk and hide a, uh, you know, a caster unit behind them, it also causes them to be kind of mobile cover. It's just an amusing little quirk. All right, next thing. Why exactly would you go for something like off-element equipment? For example, you might do something like this, which I like to uh, to call the, uh, the build rainbow. Um, essentially, uh, what you're doing here is, uh, is kind of abusing the way the game mechanics work. See, um, I, as I was explaining in the elemental version, or elemental video version uh, earlier, um, basically the game seems to be using whatever the highest bonus is at any given time. For folks that have come from the PSP version, this is why we were repeatedly getting confused as to whether or not certain things were broken. It turns out a lot less stuff is broken than it seemed, it's just, you know, different this time. Which, honestly, we should expect this by now, like, this is, this is, how many times has this happened now? Like, can you imagine? Like, we've seen over the years how many uh, FFT players went into Tactics Ogre and they're like, nothing works the same, this is broken, I don't understand it, and then they, you know, leave and get angry and then come back after they realize how good it is, but... Anyway, um, can you imagine how completely brain-screwed uh, folks must have been if they started off with something like Vagrant Story and they're like, okay, half of these use the same animation, but they do something different. Half of them do the same thing that's, but, you know, use a completely different animation. Half of, you know, then the rest of them are just kind of a weird combination. Don't ask how there's more than two halves. Just go with it. Um, then all the rest of these uh, just wound up with this uh, crazy situation where they just do something entirely different but happen to have the same name. Um, it's a Mitsuno game. We just roll with it. This is this is the crazy thing that we've just agreed to be attached to. So anyway. Okay. So let's talk numbers for a second here. First of all, do stats necessarily matter uh, once you're getting later and later into the game? Yes, but no. And what exactly do all of them do? Okay. First and foremost. These numbers over here on the top right. I really should have used a mouse for this. Why didn't I? Um, these numbers on the top right, uh, they're generally speaking going to be more or less a max hit. Okay, max hit, maximum defense. These are an ideal scenario, unaffected by most things. Uh, you're not going to see certain things reflected like element. Um, and generally speaking, uh, they're going to be kind of situational. So usually this will include your, uh, your physical scaling bonus. Uh, so of those three bonuses on the left here, this is your physical scaling bonus, this is your elemental scaling bonus, this is your racial scaling bonus. They are three entirely separate uh, entities, uh, and they combine in different ways. Anyway, 
So like right here, these are generally speaking derived stats, but these are a best case scenario that is impossible to achieve. Nothing has zero defense. There is no way to fully bypass defense. And before you're thinking Dragon Slayer, it turns out Dragon Slayer is more of a, I think it was like a 60% uh, overall damage boost pre-armor or something, uh, rather than an actual uh, defense ignoring thing this time around. So yes, everything works entirely different um, in terms of uh, that kind of stuff, but moving on. Anyway, as far as these different stats, let's once again go over their functions just to be clear on what they do. Uh, strength is uh, attack and defense on the physical side. Vitality is uh, overall defense, uh, primarily against physical attacks. Um, it seems to have a minimal to near non-existent effect on magic this time around. That is why things like summons no longer do one damage. Um, dexterity is going to be accuracy and uh, part of your scaling attack. Certain things will scale dexterity better. Agility is your physical attack, and I believe it has some function on some finishers. Avoidance is just your general avoidance against most things. Um, intelligent, like generally speaking, avoidance plus mind is going to be your best way to avoid debuffs, though they never really seem to happen. Um, something like intelligence is going to be your primary uh, offensive stat. Uh, Magic-wise, something like uh, mind is going to be your primary debuff stat, but also benefits uh, uh, to intelligence as well. And then resistance is ma mostly your magic armor. Now, as far as all this stuff's concerned, though, that's not the end of the story. Those are baseline values, and they don't always matter. It will use whatever stats are relevant to whatever thing you're using. So, first of all, don't see this entire screen as one entire whole. What you should see here is like, okay, the weapon and your physical swinging of that weapon is one interaction. Something like uh, your finishers are an entirely different interaction. Something like your spells are an entirely different interaction. So, for example, something like spells. If you're using the same element spell, you're roughly getting a 30% bonus towards that spell, and they're going to be hitting reasonably hard. You should always use the same element spells. However, if you were to use one off element that exploited a weakness, you would, roughly speaking, be getting about a 10% bonus. It's not necessarily going to be worth it. It's not very much. Um, you're actually going to be benefiting uh, just using something that uh, you are personally stronger against uh, than, uh, than going and exploiting a weakness, specifically when it comes to spells in particular. Uh, that is going to be the exception. Switching your instill, however, does not appear to have any particular interaction this time around and simply adds 25% to your physical hit. Um, now, this is a separate thing to whatever your normal hit would be. So, for example, if you're hitting a 100, it would, instead of doing 125, it would simply be 100 plus 25. Um, it'll basically tick as an entirely different damage tick. Okay? Now, if you're swinging your weapon, however, uh, the, it does not necessarily use everything that's on here. As I was explaining in an earlier video, it'll essentially just use whichever stat is highest. So, for example, if she is a water element, if she were to attack a fire unit, she would be getting 30% on the fact that uh, she is personally water element and exploiting their weakness. Um, so it would essentially be taking that physical thing if they were, uh, so plus 18% uh, for being physical, and if it were a divine thing, then, when, then it would further increase it by 23%, and then it would apply another 30% because she is water. However, if she were to attack an ice unit, it would instead swap out that water for that 23% fire bonus because it is the highest available. It is better than nothing. So essentially, if you're doing something like this, you can match your element if you want to. It is roughly going to, roughly speaking, only going to be about a 10% difference, however. Um, so if you were to give the same element weapon to that same particular unit, you can min-max, giving them that 10%, but it won't necessarily be nearly as big of a return as, for example, having a second elemental type that you can hit effectively. So if we take a look at those uh, stats that I mentioned earlier, um, you may notice something right here, where this unit that I was hyping up, uh, namely this Valkyrie, is roughly speaking 70 stat points lower on the magic offensive side than something like the Shaman here. So why exactly would I personally prefer them if damage is the only thing that would necessarily matter? Which, obviously, we've gone over that a million times, damage isn't the only thing that matters, everything is contextual. But generally speaking, when it comes to raw power, this is why something that uh, the Shaman has generally become fairly popular being one of the few units that's essentially able to more or less hammer away at something through raw numbers alone. Now, that being said, that is a massive actual uh, kind of, uh, well, massive thing to take into consideration. In order to do, roughly speaking, somewhere in the ballpark of 100 extra damage over this, uh, over this Valkyrie here, they're looking at a situation where they have gotten, again, roughly a 70 stat bonus, uh, or 70 stat point bonus, um, and this is including all of their gear. 
but at the same time they have sacrificed a lot of defensive options so the main point i'm trying to get here is not to rag on shamans again but just the fact that in many cases if you're going for just raw stats alone you're really going to be seeing a better return using non-standard units for that particular thing like you can min max sure they, pretty much you throw enough stats at anything it'll eventually hit like a truck but think about it statistically when you're in the early game you may pick up a stat card and you may immediately note may, you know notice a difference if your stats are under 100 suddenly it's like oh you know that one two percent whatever boost you're going to notice that but once your stats start getting into the uh, two to three hundreds in the late game and post game and all of that kind of thing it doesn't nearly matter as much. So, for example, um, one comment that I saw come up, and I, I'll try not to cover too many of those comments there, uh, was something along the lines of, like, well, you need all of this intelligent equipment to make an effective caster. Not really, because if we're looking at something like this, uh, where they're essentially getting 26 intelligence off of this gear right here, that matters a lot in the early game, and it's simply adequate in the late game. Um, it's not necessarily going to matter as much in some cases, and... Like, in fact, I would argue in many cases you'd be better off going for something like this. Because, think about it this way. Sure, we can look at it as, you know, this thing over here has, you know, six intelligence over this one right here. However, if we're looking at uh, different numbers here, generally speaking, there's a lot of different types of defense that are going on. The actual defense score, namely this number right here, is what I like to call hard armor. Basically, this is a flat value that's going to be deducted uh, from uh, from damage. So effectively, hard armor helps protect you against plinking type hits. However, the big hits um, are going to be resisted by your stats and your scaling resistances. So for example, right here, if you were to swap out for, let's say, something like a circlet, suddenly it's, oh, it's 8% resistance when it comes to those particular elements. They've only given up roughly uh, 12 in terms of their, um, or looks like, yeah, uh, 11 in terms of their uh, hard armor. So essentially they've reduced, they might potentially take 11 extra damage from a physical hit. Again, this is ignoring a million other factors that may potentially take place. But at the same time, and, and, and again, they might have potentially taken like 17 off their uh, magic hit there, but at the same time, they're potentially taking 8% off of a much bigger hit. Uh, so, for example, if they were to, uh, like, let's say if they were to be hit by something like uh, like a 400 or whatever else uh, coming in from a finisher, that might potentially take off 40 or 50 instead. That's kind of the, the general idea here as to why you'd use certain pieces of equipment over others. Um, uh, or is, for example, something like a, you know, Garb of Sages over here is generally just going to be a pretty universally good time. Either way, their defensive options are fairly limited. However, between all of the different shamans, I personally think, like, Sherry would be the best here, simply because of being locked into Earth Element and having something like Earth and Graves available. Why would this matter? Because this is one of the few items, and honestly, it feels almost required for somebody like Sherry here, that can completely almost entirely negate their weaknesses. Uh, namely, um, if we're looking at something like this, one of the biggest scary things for something like a shaman would be a griffin. They're almost always wind element, which she is weak to. That is roughly a 30% uh, bonus that they're going to get every time they peck her freaking nose off. So, essentially what we're looking at here is that they've already got 15% to uh, completely resist um, that, uh, that earth element, so they're already shaving off half of that damage, but at the same time, it's 10% resistance versus griffins. So, effectively, she's only taking 5 percent bonus damage versus those birds, suddenly allowing for a far better time defensively in her case. Additionally, if we look at an argument over something like a Caldia versus a shield, okay? If we look at something like the shield, we're looking at a case where effectively they're getting 20 hard armor, um, and additionally 9 hard armor uh, spell-wise, uh, 2 extra vitality, uh, so your strength and vitality are basically going to be your first layer of defense. Your hard armor is apparently going to be either your second or last layer, that part is a little bit unclear. And then, um, you know, stat-wise, damage-wise, whatever else, everything's just kind of all over the place. Honestly, we don't know a lot of this information as of yet. Still waiting for the data miners to fully figure out all of it. Please, Rakes, come back and work on this thing. <laughs> anyway... Um, so, like, if we look at the differences here, okay, so they might get 20 hard armor, that might take 20 damage off of something, that might take 3% uh, resistance off of certain things, that might uh, add some extra resistances, but there's a lot of quirks to consider here. For example, technically speaking, wait a minute, would a peck be considered a slashing attack, a crushing attack, or a piercing attack? Doesn't matter. It is a physical attack. The hell does that mean? Okay, so... 
Here's another weird quirk of the system. For whatever reason, your right hand weapon determines the type of physical resistance that you will be using. I don't know why, it's just a weird way that you tailor your defense this time around. So instead of directly resisting every different damage type, it's more like your armor is a collection of different bonuses that you won't necessarily always be able to achieve an ideal scenario for. So for example, something like a knife would end up getting dramatically better resistances with a shield than somebody, for example, using a book. Um, so in this particular case, she is using a book and uh, she is going to be getting that 2% crush as opposed to the 6% slash. And additionally, that, uh, that extra hard armor over there. So in this particular case, you know, something like a physical attacker with a knife, again, or, well, some knives, uh, would, be, uh, would be doing better in that particular scenario. However, in this particular case, we have something like the Caldia. And instead, it's got a parry chance. And the parry is, roughly speaking, a 5% chance to fully just negate a physical attack. Is that a huge chance? Eh, not amazing. But at the same time, if we were to go and, let's say, put something like a dodge on her... Suddenly, we're achieving a far more sustainable defense situation with her. Now, why would this matter? Well, essentially when it comes to ranged attacks, hopefully speaking, the main thing that archers exploit for their damage situation is going to be uh, weaknesses, right? So when it comes to archers, they generally speaking have a, a low baseline damage, but a very, very high maximum. They have the highest maximum when it comes to ranged attacks. And th this is going to be true for ranged attacks in general, but they are a very extreme case of it. So, what's the relevance of all of this stuff? Well, if, for example, uh, she already has shoes over here that can more or less completely negate uh, the fact that they're probably going to be getting a, you know, pretty decent uh, chunk of extra damage and might potentially be able to be more likely to uh, survive something like a Wind Archer firing at her. She's able to shave off half of their damage and additionally has a saving roll against it, meaning that uh, this essentially would work reasonably well at preventing some of her main uh, main uh, kind of uh, defensive issues. Uh, that uh, through the combination of the circlet, the earth shoes, and the caldia, she can to some degree at least semi-effectively protect herself, but it also does nothing against physical attacks. However, another property of the buffs at this point, uh, specifically the evasive buffs, uh, namely for a sidestep and dodge, is that they cap dodge chance, or rather they cap hit chance at 20%, or at uh, 80%. They, t they add a permanent 20% uh, dodge chance while it's active. Now, this doesn't check anything else. This doesn't check avoidance, whatever else. It just tops off how much they can potentially hit. If you're already having a chance to dodge, it will just increase 20%. Now, the reason that this is significant is because, well, that 20% is a lot more significant uh, than it uh, seems to count, um, or than it seems at first. If you've ever played XCOM, think of how unsure you were every time you were about to take an 80% shot, and now imagine every unit on the map has that. So, for example, sacrificing one of your healing items for something like a dodge could matter very significantly in terms of boss fights. So now not only do they have a dodge chance, but they suddenly have a parry chance, uh, essentially allowing them to theoretically have a good amount, a good amount more survivability. It does that necessarily mean that they're going to be charging the front lines? Hell no, but it does give them a decent bit more survivability. Whereas, for example, how would the Valkyrie approach something like this? Well, they're using a slashing weapon over here. So essentially, they're looking at a case where they've got the slash thing. They can go ahead and tailor their slash defense. Um, in this particular case, I believe I originally had... Uh, what did I have on her? Did I have Luminance? I think I had Luminance on her originally. Uh, they're on to Muz and Yuria. Let's go ahead and take those off real quick to uh, rebuild this build here. Where did I leave Yuria at? You're over here. I think I might have auto-equipped some of this stuff. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, go back to ye old Valkyrie. There we go. So while she isn't getting any offensive bonuses off of uh, gear like this, she is extraordinarily blue. She looks like uh, she came from free to play uh, RuneScape here. But uh, what we're looking at is a case where, like, slash resistance-wise, physically, that's 7% resistance, suddenly 18% resistance, uh, suddenly going up to 26% resistance, 30% resistance, 31% physical resistance. Um, did I already count this one? No, I don't believe so. So 46% physical resistance, right? Um, just off of, wait, is that right? Because, let's see, 15, going up to 22, going up to, yeah, okay, so, 40, 46% physical resistance for physical attacks. So, generally speaking, as far as the AI is concerned, 
they won't really try to attack her at that point. If there's no other targets, sure. But realistically, um, if we're looking at a case where we want a unit to be functionally invisible, having really high resistances suddenly means that the AI will look at them and be like, yeah, I, that's not worth my time. It doesn't matter that they don't, like, for example, you can give up stuff like a constitution, let them have lower health, because at that point they've just dissuaded something from attacking them entirely. Um, this is functionally speaking the equivalent of that, uh, that really smelly plant. Um, that just kind of smells like rotting meat all the time. Like, you're basically just causing somebody to not want to target you in the first place. Um, so being able to kind of tailor your resistances to very specific things could be very beneficial in that case. And in fact, uh, looking at this, if you were to max out for crush resistances, you could do some hilarious stuff with a Caldia. But anyway, that's besides the point. So point being that uh, you can, functionally speaking, make yourself invisible in a lot of cases. Now, this is all well and good, and, you know, good in uh, kind of the end game type scenario here, but what exactly, what, like, what exactly do you do in the early game, where you don't really necessarily have a whole lot going on? I mean, you still technically can tailor some, some of your defenses if you want. Uh, like, honestly, tailoring defenses has been uh, fairly useful in the, uh, the Nothing Burger challenge, uh, whereas, you know, something like this would be like 14, I think it was like 14, 15% resistance uh, using a uh, matching chain set with a bronze helm here, as well as an additional, uh, uh, if you're going all leathers, you can kind of stack for anti-racial uh, resistance there. It's, it's a minor thing, but it can be just enough to make certain units just survival enough. Uh, to help you in a case of like where you're like let's say going for a no in cap run or something like that uh just cr giving these scaling bonuses to somebody that uh that might potentially be weak to uh to an upcoming boss or something like that and using that to your advantage could make a massive difference so like let's say voltaire here like let's say he's going up against a boss with a uh, uh, with a fire element on him right so in this particular case, this would matter a lot more. If he's just fighting basic weak enemies that aren't doing very much, the uh, the hard values on this on this armor would end up going and blocking it a decent bit more. But let's say he's got a boss with a either a fire element finisher or he's got a elemental bonus uh, versus uh, Voltaire here. How would you effectively use him to tank in that case? Well, the AI would love to target a unit that has a elemental weakness. So the, you could essentially put this guy up in front. You could give him something like Rampart Aura and a Phalanx, and then suddenly, rather, despite the fact that he's technically got a weakness, you've turned that weakness into a strength because that AI will look at it and be like, oh, look, I can do so much damage to this guy, but they'll completely ignore the fact uh, that uh, that phalanx is reducing it by 15 or by 60%. This is reducing it by another 14%. Suddenly you've taken that uh, boss's aggression and effectively turn it into a non-issue. You can suddenly control the boss. Um, same thing with, uh, with archers. Why would they... Why would it matter uh, what you're doing with them early on? Um, you know, like, doesn't their uh, their damage drop off and stuff like that? And technically speaking, it can, but it all just comes down to your situation. Um, so, for example, oftentimes, you know, people will stick something like uh, like helmets or whatever else on the archers because, you know, vitality or, uh, uh, vitality or dex bonus, which is all well and good. But again, you know, they're going to be weak to a lot of things. So something like a circlet will, generally speaking, be better on the defensive front. Uh, something like chainmail is all well and good, but at the same time, you can see that there's a better pierce resistance for whatever reason on some of the other armors. Uh, but something like a balder might potentially do a far better job for them uh, than uh, something like a like a chain here, which I mean I would kind of hope so. That's more or less a direct upgrade. But something like a leather might give them the dex bonus that they want to push past that uh, first phase of uh, of defenses. Something like a balder might be better in terms of their pierce resistance, but at the same time something like the big uh, it, you get uh, something like the brigandine taking over for the leathers at that point in terms of their actual like kind of offensive armor option um like in terms of your main kind of plate thing it's not necessarily going to be as extreme as some of the other cases because weirdly enough some of their best um uh, their best uh, equipment don't want to say best in slot so to speak um, they have the weird distinction of being able to have um, a kind of universal resistance against a lot of things. Um, so, for example, something like uh, like the uh, the leather setup, as weird as it sounds, like you just keep upgrading your main plate body thing, but then you keep something like this to give you very um, very kind of niche resistance against just about everything. Good pierce resistance, good elemental resistance off of this, um, and then good hard armor off of your basic armor. And then you go like let's say something like um, 
Uh, you go for something like a dagger plus uh, plus a, a short bow, and weirdly enough, you have a frontline um, a frontline archer. Is this necessarily going to be you know best thing at all times? Obviously, you know not necessarily, but it does give you something to play with. Uh, it does. It, this is actually surprisingly more effective than it looks. Um, reason being that again they are an exploitation class. So in the case of something like this, you have somebody that you know is again guaranteeing stuns. Potentially having, just like that uh, caster example earlier, the option to go and parry. Um, depending on how you want to handle this, uh, you can potentially um, uh, potentially tailor your armor through your different weapon types. Um, actually, one weird thing to throw out there. Um, kind of lost my train of thought a little bit earlier, but if you're looking for a case where you want to have a hyper-defensive arm uh, archer, uh, equip a stone bow, because uh, suddenly uh, you got a, a crushing damage type on there. Generally speaking, crushing is going to be easier to resist than other damage types, so 3% off the bronze. Uh, you've got uh, something like, um, uh, where was it, uh, another 3% off chain, another, um, uh, where the other, I believe it was the, uh, eh, whatever, that's not here. Another 3% off the, off the gloves, another 3% uh, off the chain legs, and then something like a defender ring. If you have somebody that you want to sit there and tank and charge up, suddenly you have 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15% uh, uh, resistance, again, similar to that tank uh, from earlier, as well as some um, elemental and um, uh, racial resistances on this, that's able to, um, that's a essentially able to, uh, to spam something like Brimstone Hail or what have you. Again, bear in mind, finishers have different properties to your basic attack type. So in this particular case, uh, while the basic attack might not do very much, this might be a very effective, like, a tanky finisher spammer, as weird as it looks. So hopefully that helped to explain some of that in terms of why exactly those mechanics would matter. I know it's a super weird and kind of like, why would you get into the nitty gritty, that hard kind of thing? But hey, if you're challenged running the game, you're going to be running into some weird mechanics. All right, other weird stuff to consider. Uh, Caster-wise, especially in the early game, um... I've said this ad nauseum, but, like, consider debuffs. Like, it, when it comes to the math um, of something like Poison Cloud there, 10% of even low damage is going to be in the 50 to 60 range. Uh, by the uh, by the end game, you're looking at 400 per tick, which means that it is roughly 1,200 per round. Okay? It takes uh, getting up to, like, good rolling high-end summons to actually uh, exceed that damage, and that is at a cost of almost four times the MP and dramatically more recovery time. Uh, so, like, let's see, looking at this, it's uh, 14 RT and 20 MP, whereas, for example, high-end summons are 24 RT and 70 MP, um, with less range and whatever else. Even if it's only, like... It bottom with concentration. This bottoms out at thirty percent. If you don't want to wait for concentration to roll, just get some black powder. Uh, just start off a fight with uh, with black powder there. If you're really having a hard time co with concentration rolling, something like this, rather than worrying about particular elements or worrying about uh, about having to worry about uh, you know weaknesses or whatever else, you uh, charm them into a particular elemental strength for that particular fight, and focus on using debuffs for your damage. Almost nothing is actually immune to poison. So really just consider using it uh, on your casters. Um, as far as I'm concerned, for the vast majority in, of the game, up until you get into the very, very end game, and even then it's arguable that uh, you could go different ways about it, um, really it's going to be your best overall damage output. Around the middle of the game, this actually tends to uh, uh, start landing ballpark in the 100% um, range. Um, and especially once you start getting access to mind-boosting gear, uh, that's one of those few cases where you can very, very easily focus on boosting only a single stat, uh, because it checks mind exclusively uh, for your accuracy. Um, so really, at that point, it's just whatever boosts mind, you can start hitting extremely hard. Plus, if you're using a Caldia, which you reasonably should already be doing, because it's just the premier defensive option for casters, you basically have a free uh, charm to allow your uh, Meditate time to roll. Once you get access to stuff like Conserve, RT, and Engulf, like, you just have complete control by that point. You can just poison whatever, when, uh, whenever. You have, uh, if you've ever played Rise of Nations, um, basically you've uh, achieved the equivalent of, of uh, playing as either uh, Rome or Russia in that one, where you're just like, you, you just have instant attrition against everything on the map. Um, basically, that's what we're looking at there. Uh, you've managed to uh, destroy the enemy supply wagons. Um, anyway, 
Um, next up, in terms of whether uniques truly matter, they usually will... Again, every unit is just a case of they are an RT uh, uh, plus a, a stat sheet. Um, for all intents and purposes, everyone has the same access aside from units that have unique classes. Something like White Knight will obviously stick out in terms of uh, just having something that's so dang good that you reasonably should put them in your party. Uh, but reasonably, there's you can get through the entire thing just fine using absolutely low ball generics. Um, if you go and turn somebody into a completely different class that's not one of their unique things, screw it. They're still going to do the job just fine. And in many cases, they might potentially have been min-maxed for something that you just simply don't want to waste time on. For example, sure, you can make a bulky caster type, but at the same time, you can also just take, let's say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hamilton over here and turn him into a lich. It's hilarious. He's got double the health of a normal lich um, and very good defensive stats. And despite that, uh, he's, uh, he's still a pretty effective caster. So just something to consider, min-maxing is not necessary. Um, basically, everything is... <sighs> even at a baseline, it's very rare in this version uh, to be running into those situations where, where you're necessarily doing one damage. Even the lowest damage classes are still going to be only a few charms away from reasonably breaking past defenses pretty well. Uh, if you ever see a unit that's fully falling behind, don't abandon them. Just throw some charms their way and they'll be just fine. Um, I feel like there's way too much of a focus, and there always has been, uh, of uh, folks coming in and, you know, trying to fully min-max everything, trying to fully, like, get the absolute most out of every unit. Just don't worry about any of that. Honestly, that that's the best thing I can say. I don't know why they added 100% uh, uh, completion uh, kind of timer in this particular version, but reasonably speaking, don't worry about min-maxing. Don't worry about getting every character. Don't worry about completely maxing them all out. Whether or not it, any particular thing matters is going to be very, very, very situational. Um, it's going, going to be entirely on context. You can make the strongest unit in the game and they are still going to be doing dramatically less uh, in certain situations because, let's be honest, percentages tend to win out over everything. Which is, again, why things like, uh, like, like attacking uh, elements that something is weak to is going to matter dramatically more uh, than whether or not you've gotten 40 extra stat points on that unit. Uh, for, uh, for context, by the way, when a, I, I had this in an earlier version of the video, and that is to say I kind of forgot to hit the record button. Anyway, so 70 stat difference between these two units, right? So ballpark, if, uh, this, if they both have Nature's Touch activated... She's doing neutral about 250, and uh, with Nature's Touch, she's doing about 330 against a unit that's uh, that she's uh, that she's eff uh, effectively exploiting the weakness of. Uh, in her case, she's effectively doing roughly like 280 uh, on a neutral, and then roughly speaking, uh, going uh, I think it was like 360 or something against something that uh, that's weak to it. Now, is this going to tell the full story? No, it's obviously not taking all armor situations into consideration. One of them might have had better resistance. One of them might have had a better shield. There's no way to account for absolutely everything under every circumstance because every single interaction is just different. Um, <clears throat> but my point here is that that is a that it's 70 points that made that difference. Uh, that is effectively like if you're going through the, through the entirety of Palace of the Dead, you never use any of the charms there. You're looking. And if you end up achieving all of the stuff along the way, you're maybe looking at, let's say, like, roughly, let's say, 20 to 30 charms. If you're just, like, if you just leave it on auto and just burn through the entire thing, you're looking at 20, 30 charms, okay, um, of each stat point. They tend to kind of scatter them about, okay? Now, obviously, yes, you can min-max that until you get to the point where you're getting, like, let's say, 30 to 40 for every one of your runs through Palace of the Dead, but we're talking, like ballpark numbers here, right? We're talking about reasonable, like, not going full sweat lord on it type situations. Because in most cases, when folks are going through Palace of the Dead, they're probably just going to want to leave it on a high, right? Okay, so um, in this particular case, that would be a massive amount of time to gain those particular stats when they would essentially just be able to do far more damage by going and uh, taking advantage of an exploitation there. Again, 250 to, what was it, like 350 I said? Um, essentially that, uh, that 100 damage was essentially the same difference as those 70 stat points. Sure, you can eventually get everybody's stats up if you really, 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 really want to, and you can do that with absolutely any class for any reason. I mean, 
that's basically what I did over here with Bonya Ree. They're a random archer dude that was in my uh, party from the very beginning. Uh, which is why they randomly got uh, sex changed into a terrifying ninja. I don't know, just go with it. Um, but, in this particular case, they're effectively the best spellcaster in the entire team, uh, with a uh, uh, with a ninja class on there. <laughs> Despite the fact that, you know, again, they are basically a generic ninja. It, it None of this matters. In terms of whether or not you really want to min-max somebody for a particular thing, it really does not matter. You can break anything. It's it's an RPG. There's nothing that is not breakable. If a number can move, it can move infinitely. Um, so ultimately, it ends up coming down to how much time and effectiveness are you losing, you know, for that time. How much sanity are you willing to sacrifice for the purpose of making the number go up? Um, and basically, aside from the Ogre Blade trick, you're really getting diminishing returns for a lot of this stuff. Um, just uh, just like, for example, with, uh, with ma not even maxing out, but like this was, th these three were the result of going through Palace of, D of the Dead and San Bronza multiple times. It wasn't really the only cause of going through that. I was kind of trying to get all kinds of different items for testing purposes. Um, and even then, you can tell their stats are barely, if, if at all, breaking the 300s. Um, and basically the way that I was going at this was uh, giving the uh, the Dex and um, some of the Strength Charms device, giving the Int and Mind stuff to Kashua, and then giving uh, the Avoidance, Agility, and Strength uh, stuff to, uh, to Denim. Because I wanted to see how high Avoidance and Agility can go. Surprisingly, even with Avoidance as, a, uh, as his uh, highest stat, um, he's still not avoiding very much. But hey, eventually he might eventually do something. <laughs> um, but again, this just kind of comes out uh, comes out to uh, the difference that percentages make. The uh, twenty percent of defense off of smoke screen made a massive difference. Um, in fact, I ended up even getting rid of Mother's Mercy for smoke screen because just the uh, the sheer uh, ability to completely avoid those debuffs in the first place made a far bigger difference uh, than actually uh, being able to get rid of them. I really would have thought this would go the other way, but it did actually matter quite a quite a decent bit uh, when I was uh, going and repeatedly going through stuff like Code of Four. Um, so yeah, I, all of this is basically a half hour to more or less say that percentages are king, stats are okay, gear percentages are really going to matter a lot more than any of the other hard values. If you're early on in the game and you're still trying to learn a lot of uh, a lot of the mechanics and things like that. Um, hard attack values may not necessarily be the thing to go for. Really, debuffs are going to be king in the early game, as far as I'm concerned. Um, in terms of just doing a quick little uh, crafting guide in terms of what's useful and what isn't, I'm probably going to make this its own thing at some point. But if you are, let's say, stuck in the early to mid game and you just want a few options to potentially consider to make a lot of things easier, um, first and foremost, Cat Claws, Tiger Claws, basically it's just poison on hit. Same old, same old, uh, something like uh, Vigorous, Mighty Strike, um, or uh, Tremendous, or not Tremendous, but, um, well, hell, I was thinking Terrifying Impact, but that's going to be for the other weapons. Anyway, Warrior's Claws, they do poison. Um, Dagger-wise, uh, something like um, uh, something like a Dirk plus one. Again, it's not necessarily going to be massive early on. Or not Dirk, uh, was it, why is, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the buy screen, not the craft screen, hold on, sorry. Brain is uh, going a little bit funky there. Um, so in terms of melee weapons, yeah, cat claws, poison claws are just going to be your poison option. Again, percentages are king. That is 10% damage per tick. Um, in terms of daggers, uh, silence will effectively neuter a lot of casters. I've said this one ad nauseum, but like just something to consider. Same thing with a uh, stone once you get access to Damask, but that's going to be towards the temples later. Uh, something like False Strike off a Rapier doesn't seem like much, but again, that is 20%. Uh, that 20% stacks with the other 20% with Dodge, so potentially if you manage to, like, let's say, uh, uh, create a counter build uh, later on in the game, like a uh, Rapier in the uh, main hand um, and offhand Lombardia or uh, crafted, uh, uh, crafted Shortbow, is going to give you a, a counter attack here. Uh, that is to say, the better crafted cross, uh, not crossbow, but uh, uh, longbows. Um, basically, the compound bows there will again just be a nice little uh, combination there in terms of just free false strike on a lot of things. It's kind of like a diet version of a smoke screen there. Um, same thing for the cutlass is just a direct upgrade of that. Um, for the two handers, uh, obviously is way plus claymore. Just put that on Terra Knight, breach, fear, plus an archer instant deletion. Um, again, any ranged attack will scale dramatically more uh, than anything else. 
you can use that on anything like something like a uh, something like a uh, Vartan with a uh, uh, with a bow and an and still on there will do absolutely tremendously. Um, uh, heavy axe wise, misstep is eh, axes don't really get too many nice things. I will say that like their finisher suite. I would say is probably the most spammable um, in terms of the heavy weapons, and they do pretty good overall hit-wise, but misstep is not too great. Um, stuff like uh, Scorpion and Breach, um, you know, Poison and Breach off of your spears, absolutely wonderful, goes great with vigorous attack. Um, you get a very early stun option in the form of Iron Fans here, though uh, uh, actually getting a hold of a Caldia early can be a little bit of a thing until you get to for Rampa. Um, that being said, um, they... Uh, the actual benefits of some of these are pretty solid, uh, like a warrior with a balder hammer is very good on the silencing front there. Um, in terms of 1HKs, they don't get very much until they get uh, Muzo Blades over here. They don't really get a guarantee that they can inflict themselves either. Um, Mage Blade, I'd say, is pretty solid for, um, uh, for Swordmasters for quite a while. Um, actually, interesting little thing, um, but when it comes to something like uh, the Superior Hel uh, Helm Haver, until you get to the higher end uh, swords, I'd say this is probably the best 2HK, because again, preempt plus stun, uh, they can effectively roll a stun chance uh, before even attacking. So this is one of those cases where you can actually um, guarantee the stun as well. So you basically take your uh, your Fall Blade, your Helm Haver, um, they essentially will attack and stun. Um, now, back in the original PSP version, this would have just simply stopped them from attacking outright, but they still have a 50% chance to not attack in this version, so just something to consider. Um, originally, um, I thought uh, combat maces were pretty dumb in this one. Um, by that being said, Sniper Terror Knight is actually still good. It's not super sexy or anything else, but honestly, they are they still do the job. They're effectively kind of like your... Um, kind of like your uh, skirmisher soldier guy back from the PSP version, where it's going to be just enough damage, it's going to be consistent damage, it's not necessarily going to be mind-blowing damage, but generally speaking, they can kind of make sure that nothing attacks them, because heavy armor plus mace, I mean, they're usually pretty solid. Again, they're not really doing very much, because uh, cudgels as a whole scale as a category, uh, like if you've ever wondered why uh, why the maces do no extra damage for the most part over their uh, their staff counterparts, the attack bonus only applies in the case of finishers, um, where it'll take the attack value, but it will ignore the category scaling value. Um, whereas, for example, these ones will generally scale a lot worse because it's only using the uh, the finisher's attack value on its own. It's not actually adding anything. Anyway, so either way, additional range for uh, the Terranite abilities is honestly a pretty reasonable uh, uh, use case for those things. Um, I mean, the whips are pretty much quirky by design up and down the board same thing with the books same thing with the instruments those things are just great um anyway so hopefully i hopefully this is at least somewhat helpful to someone somewhere um again additional stuff will be kind of thrown out there as it comes up just uh just again bear in mind the thing to remember is that it's never that simple. Nothing in this game is ever as simple as just doing what it says on the tin, so to speak. <laughs> I think probably uh, maybe nowhere is that more simple than, uh, uh, where was it over here? Uh, than something like uh, the Slayer moves, where, like for example right here, you see that it's got a bow in the icon. It tells you that it, uh, that it only works on melee hits, but that's just simply not the case. And Additionally, um, I was wondering earlier why it was that it seemed like something like the Keening uh, or the Keening Bowgun wasn't doing the damage that I thought it was. It is. Um, it's just uh, apparently the units that I was testing it on, namely the Sand Bronze uh, uh, Cockatrices and Griffins, just have like 60 vitality over everything else. So, <laughs> so it was basically eating a lot of that bonus before it actually got to them. But when I was testing it a decent bit further, this thing absolutely eats monster units. Um, Actually, another thing in terms of general weapon categories for the end game, just to throw yet another thing out into the works here. Um, when it comes into the end game, something to know about bows and crossbows. Bows are generally going to be your very effective against a very oddly specific thing hitting option. Like these hit harder on their own. They generally speaking will scale a decent bit uh, higher on their own, but they don't have uh, uh, too many kind of niche options. 
Whereas, for example, something like bows will usually have slightly lower bonuses, um, but generally speaking, uh, if used in the right context, they'll do dramatically more. So, like, for example, something like the brimstone here um, can easily one-shot uh, stuff in Code of Four, uh, whereas, for example, the Thunderbow, despite having dramatically higher bonuses in this particular context, wouldn't be getting that people bonus, so it wouldn't be necessarily scaling as high. But this thing tends to do dramatically better in the mid-game due, due to the lizard bonus. So, either way, as far as your ranged weapons go, never get rid of any of them. Just keep a wide variety of them on hand. Use the right thing at the right time. Use the right weapon in the right circumstance, and you'll see dramatically better performance out of ranged units. If you're somebody that's been on the fence and wondering why there's generally been more of a turnaround as to why folks are accepting you know, ranged units a bit more, that kind of stuff is why. Especially something like crossbows in the hands of a Dragoon are initially not the greatest thing in the world, but... Um, but yeah, once you start getting these uh, these fancier things, like we're looking at a case like if they're firing at a griffin with this thing, it's not only getting the whatever 60% bonus off of a Slayer, it's not only getting the potential, I think it's like 25% bonus off of Bane, it's also getting another 28% off of the Pierce bonus uh, uh, from the crossbow itself, plus an, an additional 25% uh, against uh, beast units. So at that point, it's just getting completely melted. Um, either way, either way, yes, it is all very oddly specific. Yes... You know, Dragoons are still kind of an odd, quirky unit, uh, but hopefully all of this stuff helped explain a few weird odds and ends in the endgame. Um, anyway, so that's about that. Y'all have a good one, and um, hopefully some more specific guides coming up soon. I just kind of wanted to start off with a sort of general guide, and then we'll get into the more specific stuff next. All right, thank you for stopping by. Have a good one.